the book of Galatians together, and we come to the sixth chapter. As you're aware, what we call the books of our New Testament were really written as letters, and this was Paul's letter to the churches in the region of Galatia, but uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, God and his uh, providence had them arranged then for us in chapters and verses, which makes it much easier for us to work our way through. But we don't want to lose our perspective that these were letters. And uh, they're written as letters. They are not necessarily organized like you would if you were sitting down and putting together a theological book. Uh, but there is a flow to them as the Spirit directed when we come into chapter 5, Paul, as he's been dealing with the whole issue of the finality of the work of Christ and the completeness of the gospel, not only for our justification through faith in Christ, but for a life of sanctification. And those false teachers who were trying to uh, turn the Galatian believers over to the law as an addition to Christ, uh, to make them more complete, Paul is correcting that error. It's not part of God's plan for salvation. It's not part of God's plan for sanctification. That is still an issue in the church of Jesus Christ today. As many promote uh, the Mosaic law as necessary for our sanctification. In the first 12 verses of chapter 5, Paul set forth that we've been set free in Christ. And you can't reject that freedom and subject yourself to the bondage of the law. That would be uh, totally contradictory. And you see something of his concern and frustration in verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from believing the truth? This persuasion did not come from whom it calls you. This is not part of God's work in your life. Uh, you've allowed influences contrary to God's will and God's work to influence you. Uh, but don't misunderstand. Freedom from any obligations to the Mosaic law does not mean freedom to do what you please. So verses uh, 13 to 18 emphasize that God's provision for us is to live under the authority and control of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So being free from the Mosaic law and obligation to the Mosaic law does not mean we are lawless that we are without authority in our lives. But rather we live now under the authority and control of the Holy Spirit. So verse 13, you were called to freedom, brethren, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. This is an opportunity uh, to exercise love in serving one another. Uh, verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desire of the flesh. There's a solution, not to try to implement the Mosaic law to be sure uh, you won't do wrong things, sinful things. Walk by the Spirit. Uh, if you're walking under the control and direction of the Holy Spirit, then you won't fulfill the sinful desires of the flesh, the old man, the old nature. And there is a conflict there, as he mentions in verse 17. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, verse 18. Then he drew the contrast, giving examples of how the flesh manifests itself, showing things that ought not to be characteristic of a believer's life. Uh, they manifest the fact that we're not walking by the Spirit. We're not allowing the Spirit to control us. And it's not a complete list, but verse 19 called them the deeds or works of the flesh, which are evident. There's no doubt that these 
uh, are contrary to God's will for us, contrary to God's character, which is being produced in us by the Spirit. And the end of verse 21, a warning. If these things are characteristic of your life, you're not really a child of God. Uh, you're not destined to be part of the kingdom that he will establish someday. You will not inherit that kingdom. In contrast, we looked at the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23. Um, that's the character of God manifest in us. So it's not like, well, it's subjective. It's how you feel. We sometimes get to that. Well, you know, I feel all right with my relationship with the Lord. Well, it's a, if the works of the flesh are being manifest there, you shouldn't feel all right. And he's going to deal with that. If that conduct's evident in your life, it has to be dealt with by you. And other believers have to help with the dealing of that. But the beauty of God's character is what should be being produced in us. The enablement for this, verse 24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That doesn't mean that the flesh, the old nature, the old man, however you want to term it, uh, term it uh, no longer exists. But as Romans 6 makes clear, its power and authority over us has been broken. The unbeliever is enslaved to sin. We were before we were set free in Christ. But now that we were identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, we have been raised a new life. As again, Romans 6 develops it much more fully. Uh, so we've been set free from slavery to sin and sinful uh, passions and desires. So we've been made, made alive by the Spirit, verse 25. And if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. And uh, the sometimes disassociation that, well, yes, we're justified by faith, but it's important for us now to have the Mosaic law as a way of life. Sometimes identified with present day Reformed theology, uh, which uh, is contrary to what he is saying here. We were made alive by the Spirit, and that's how we now live. And if you're living under the control of the Spirit, boy, would you need the Mosaic Law. Uh, what would that bring to your life? We are to walk by the Spirit. Remember, we noted that word walk is not the normal one translated, but it means to keep in step with the Spirit. Stay in line. Uh, keep in step. I say that because that's going to come up as we move into chapter 6. And then the warning, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And this sort of bracket we're, we're going to talk about, because if you jump down to chapter 6, verse 3, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So you see this concern that believers don't have an accurate self-evaluation in light of the scripture and are not conducting themselves properly together. So he begins chapter 6 as we have it by, and what chapter 6 verses 1 to 10 are going to give some concrete instructions on what it means to walk by the Spirit. Keeping in step with the Spirit. Having him direct and control our lives. Uh, he starts chapter 6 with brethren. And the letter of the Galatians is a harsh letter. Uh, Paul has spoken firmly to these believers. But his favorite way to address them is as brethren. And it's a, an expression with warmth. He identifies himself with them. Uh, you know, it's sort of like your children when you have to deal sternly with them and rebuke them. At the same time, you tell them, well, you know, I love you. 
Uh, I'm concerned for you. And that's what Paul's conveying. Brethren, come back to, just look at how many times he does this in chapter 1 of Galatians. After the words, verse 6, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ. I mean, this is rather blunt, firm, direct. He says in verse 11, For I would have you know, brethren, identify with you. We are God's family. We are spiritual family, relatives. Uh, we are connected to one another. So I call you my brethren. Uh, come over to chapter 3, verse 15. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Again, uh, that reminder, he opened this chapter, as we have it, with calling them, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? But that doesn't mean he's stepping back and cutting off all fellowship and relationship with them. That he sees them, at least if not separated from him, at a lower level than him. You're my family. You're my brethren. So brethren, I speak in terms of uh, human relations. On chapter 4, verse 12. And this is after verse 11. I fear I have labored over you in vain. This drift, if it doesn't stop, would indicate you were never saved. Uh, I'm concerned. But then he says, verse 12, I beg of you, brethren... So you see something of the love he has for them. And he's, in his heart, he believes they've truly trusted Christ. They are truly uh, bound together as God's children, partakers of the divine nature. I beg of you, brethren. Uh, down in verse 28 of chapter 4. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. I mean, he was to encourage them, build them up. Verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman. You see how he has uh, made sure that he uh, is connected to them. I'm not this spiritual giant talking down to you. Uh, I don't see... You know, you in a different category than myself. We're brethren. So even the firm, harsh things that he said to them were said out of a love for them. Like you deal with your family. Um, you may be firm, you may be stern, but you're driven by a love and uh, an awareness of, you know, we are family. So this repeated Statement down in chapter 5, verse 11. Uh, but brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then down to verse 13, you were called to freedom, brethren. I mean, you see how many times he's called them brethren. We note this as a harsh letter, and it is. There's no opening greetings. And... Uh, We'll see, there's no closing greetings. Uh, it opened rather abruptly, and it will close rather abruptly. But it's all in love. We are family. And I'm addressing you as brethren. I don't address you as one up here and you down here. He has certain authority as an apostle. His message is binding. But in his personal relationship... We are brethren. So that's how he starts out here in chapter 6, uh, verse 1. Brethren. And now he's going to deal with them and how you have to help family members who may have gotten out of step with the Spirit. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass. So he's talked about what the works of the flesh are. He's talked about the fruit of the Spirit. He's talked about verse 24 of chapter 5. 
We've been crucified with Christ. The passions and desires. Then exhort him, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. But the reality of it is believers do sin. And so now, if anyone in the family is caught in a trespass, in any trespass, uh, how do we deal with it? Uh, we don't get confused. We talk about this as a, a firm letter, even harsh at times. But this doesn't mean we cut off from one another. We're involved with one another as God's people. So what do you do with a Christian who sins? Well, we'll have to get rid of them. No, if anyone is caught in any trespass, uh, Trespass here, a man mentioned in verse 25 of chapter 5, walk by the Spirit means to keep in line, keep in step with the Spirit. Well, this word translated trespass literally means to fall out of line, to have a false step, you know, be like someone marching, you know, like the military. And, everybody, and then you have someone who's out of step. And here, this person is caught in a trespass. He's not in step with the Spirit. He's fallen out of step. He's not walking by the Spirit. That means now he is in an area of rebellion against God. This word's used uh, often in the New Testament in the sense of transgression or sin. Um, Here in the context, that's what he's talking about as well. He's caught in any sin. Uh, The flesh has manifested itself. Uh, Any of these areas that we saw may have been an area where he's become ensnared, uh, captured by it, uh, entangled in it. What are we to do? You who are spiritual. Now, this is not... You who are up here, step down to this poor lower level brother. No, if we're brethren, your family. But those who are spiritual are those who are walking by the Spirit. So now you want to reach out to help restore this Fallen brethren, if you will. So he says, you who are spiritual, not the meaning you who are high, think of yourselves more highly, because that's where, remember, you wouldn't have the chapter division in the letter. You would have verse 26 of chapter 5. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And a warning in verse 3 of chapter 6, just after the section we're going to be looking at, if anyone thinks himself thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives him. Be careful, spiritual arrogance doesn't set in in this process. It's easy when a fellow believer gets ensnared in sin, gets out of step with the Spirit, and you're not out of step with the Spirit, you have to be careful because you can get out of step by not responding properly. That's the warning here. Uh, What we have to be careful about, you who are spiritual, Walking in step with the Spirit. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Restore such a one. Put such a one back in proper order. Uh, Restore him to his his former condition. Uh, I mean, to repair, make complete. And this word we've talked about in other other contexts. Uh, it was used in medical context of repairing a broken bone. You know, if you break a bone, they'll talk about they had to reset the bone. Put it in proper alignment. Uh, put it back in right connection. Uh, restore it. And uh, as we've looked on other occasions, it's used a couple of times in the Gospels. Matthew 4.21, Mark 1.19 of fishermen mending their nets. What do they do after fishing? Some of the nets break in places. They need repaired, restored to proper order, workable order. 
That's the word here. Uh, the point here is that these believers who are walking by the Spirit don't now just look with disdain on this believer who's got not a step, fallen aside, been entrapped in sin. Now they become involved in helping get him back into right relationship with the Lord and also with other believers. Uh, and we ought to note, this is given as a command, restore such a one. Uh, it's a present imperative. It's a command given in the present tense. Uh, this is not optional. If we are walking by the Spirit, we will obey what God tells us to do. And he gives a command here. You must be restoring this one caught in sin. In a spirit of gentleness. Uh, gentleness. This was one of the fruit of the Spirit up in verse 23. Gentleness. Uh, it's to take place with the proper attitude. Uh, sensitivity. Consideration. Not with self-righteous superiority. As your spiritual superior, I'm here to help you. Uh, I understand you're weak and not very mature, but I'll help you out. That kind of attitude, but a spirit of meekness, gentleness, um, understanding. Um, the goal is restoration here. The goal is to get him right and right and back back in right condition. And a warning. Uh, looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted also. Um, and there's a breadth to this. You get involved. It could be, you know, you might get drawn into the sin as well. But in the context, what's he talk about? Verse 26 of chapter 5. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. In verse 3, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And then he'll go on, as we'll see in a future study. So the danger is we get the wrong attitude even in helping this person. We begin to see ourselves as spiritually better. That's true. We haven't fallen into their in sin. But we understand that could happen to me. I'm not so spiritually perfected that I would never sin. Let's be careful because in our categorizing of sin, we can develop this kind of attitude. And I have believers who have expressed it exactly to me. I know I sin, but I never sinned like that. Oh, really? Well, you just did. Why? Because we're proud, we're arrogant. And we're like the Pharisees. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not a sinner like other men. And that's what we have to be careful of, that we not get tempted in this, that of course I'm willing to help him. I, you know, realize less mature people than me stumble, and I'm glad to be a help to them. I'm really coming at it with an attitude of arrogant self-righteousness, which has entangled me in my own sin. Uh, that's why it's a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself that uh, you not be tempted. Now, this can be a process of restoring a person. You know, it just doesn't mean you take them aside, you tell them, and that's the end of it. There is a process that may get involved here. The goal is restoration. Uh, verse 6, chapter 6, verse 1. Restore such a one. We don't want to lose sight of the goal. It's restoration. That's the goal. Not to make him feel bad. Not to make him feel inferior. 
not to make him think he's a second class citizen, any of this, to restore him. We lose sight of that, we get wandering off here. And I'm concerned that sometimes we lose sight of that. This may be a process. Uh, Come back to Matthew 18. You see the similar context before we come back and uh, tie it together in uh, Galatians. Matthew 18, and we think of it as church discipline, but he's talking about, and he uses the comparison, he starts with little children, and uh, the first part of chapter 18, you become converted, become like children. That uh, humbleness, meekness, uh, when you really come to recognize I'm the, I'm the sinner, and I come to trust Christ. And then he warns about how important these are God's little children in the picture here. He transfers from that physical little child to the spiritual picture he wants them to understand. Uh, and down verse 10. See, you do not despise one of these little ones. I say to you, their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think, verse 12, if, any, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, doesn't he leave the 99 and go search for the one who's straying? And it turns out that he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. He's talking here about the spiritual little ones, the brethren, your Father in heaven. You see now the family here, connection. We are brethren, why? We, because we are God's children. The picture here is one of warmth and love and compassion. It's not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. So then we come into verse 15, if your brother sins. So we have the similar picture of Galatians. Brethren. And if anyone falls into a trespass, that's the picture here. If your brother sins, uh, well, you see how you enter into this. We're family. This is God's concern for this little one. That's why we have the command in Galatians 6, the responsibility of those who are walking with the Spirit to act as God's agents in putting them back together. Uh, getting them back in right relationship. So he comes out of that because it's not God's will that they go on and perish. It's God's will they be restored. And so here you get a fuller development of the restoration that may be involved. But the goal is the same thing. It's not God's will they perish. So if your brother sins, you go and show him his fault in private. If you listen to him, you've won your brother. So we're restoring. So this is how we're approaching it. Start out, I want to go and help. You're in sin. It needs to be dealt with. It says, go and show him his fault in private. And go show him his fault. Keep your finger here. Come back to 1 Timothy 5. There's a continuity in these passages that deal with this kind of subject of how you restore sinning Christians. And we need to know because it's important we do it God's way. Otherwise, we fall into what the error we're warned about. Watch out that you're not tempted and fail to handle it God's way. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. And here he's dealing with an elder who sins. But the principles are the same. You need the same number of witnesses. And note verse 20. Those who continue in sin, rebuke. That word translated rebuke is the same word, if you will now thumb back to Matthew 18, verse 15, show him his fault. Um, You have in the margin of your Bible, at least my Bible, have a little number two in front of shell. And you have reprove. It's the same word. 
in the same mood. It's an imperative. It's a command given. Reprove him. Rebuke him. Show him his fault. And there's a firmness in it. What you're doing is sin. It must stop. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. You've what? Helped to restore him to right relationship with God and other believers. That's God's goal. It's not his will that any would, one of these little ones would perish, verse 14. So when they get out of step with the Spirit, his plan is they be restored back to where they should be. I mean, God's provided the cleansing for them in Christ. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Um, but there is a process for restoration. If he doesn't listen to you, if he does, great. Um, and, you know, the point's not to try, well, first I have to make sure he feels bad enough. If he listens to you and, yeah, I'm in sin, I've had a heart, I don't know how to get out of it. I've had people come and say, you know, I'm in, I'm in sin, I, I don't know what to do, I can't get out. Sometimes you, if you've been a believer long, you've probably been used to the Lord in that process, or maybe somebody's helped you in that way. Yeah, and I, I want to help you. I want to be there for you. Uh, you're not in this alone. We're a family kind of thing. If he won't listen, he's stubborn, I'm not going to give up the sin. Uh, then take two or three witnesses with you. Um that it might be confirmed that he understands this is serious business. Um, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Uh, we get the body involved. This is the bigger, the, the larger family now becomes involved in this. Sometimes, you know, maybe in situations even with your physical family. You get the point. You say, we're going to have a family conference on this. Uh, everybody, we're going to sit down. We have to talk about this uh, kind of thing. This is what's going on spiritually here. Um, and then if he won't, he has to be put out of the family, cut off from the family. Uh, not because now you hate him, now you despise him. Because there are passages, as we've done when we talk, you, you don't consider an enemy. You continue to admonish him as a brother. Uh, that's the process. So when we read the restore, uh, you get some idea, oh, how do we follow this through? Now the question is, how often do I go through this? And uh, so Peter speaks up and came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And it becomes personal. You know, where it can become an issue. Uh, someone sins against me. One sin, another one sins against you in the body. Well, you become aware of that right away. Well, the response is not to run and go tell somebody. You know what they did? To confront the person uh, about the sin. Well, how often do I go through this process? Whether it's sin against me or sin, I become dealing with a believer's sins. If he sins against me seven times, Jesus, and you're aware said, I say not to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Then he told the account of the slave who ran up this huge debt of his, against his master. His master forgave him. Then he had a fellow slave who had a minor debt, but he wouldn't forgive him. And so Jesus bringing it down to verse 33. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? And he hands him over to the torturers. In verse 35, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if you do not for each one forgive his brother from your heart. The point here is for those who have truly become God's children, we understand and appreciate the magnitude of God's forgiveness of us. Um, it's overwhelming. The point is, no one could ever sin against me as much as I've sinned against God. 
I mean, my life has been a life of sin and rebellion against him. Yet he stepped in and forgave me. My sin was so great, I deserved an eternal hell. And yet he stepped in and forgave me. The point is, if you're not forgiving, you're not a forgiven person. We talk about love being the mark of a believer, and it is. Jesus said it is. But so is forgiveness. And an unforgiving believer is an oxymoron. God says, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. That's a mark that you've never been forgiven yet. How can I refuse forgiveness to someone no matter what they've done if I understand something of the greatness of God's forgiveness? Now, it's true, even as believers, we can slip. And especially if you were blessed by God to be saved at a younger age. And by God's grace, you were spared involvement in some of what we call the horrendous kinds of sins. Um, we tend to play down the others. We can over time forget we were just like them. We've gone to Titus 3, remember? Uh, Paul tells Titus to remind the believers to treat the unbelievers with understanding, graciousness, because you were one day just like them. You know, there's something ugly about believers with that disdain toward unbelievers. I don't even like to be like them. Oh, I don't want to be involved with them in the things they do, but I want to have an understanding. I was just like them. I'd be doing what they did. I'd be living like they live. It weren't for the grace of God. I'd have never done some of those things. Maybe not. But as God looked at your heart, what did he see? A heart that was deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. So then, forgiveness becomes required. Seventy times seven. I don't think he was sincere in uh, asking for forgiveness. You know, I try to simplify things. We've talked about this in Galatians. We as believers have to be clear in what our responsibility is. We become experts in what other people's responsibility is. What is my responsibility here? As Jesus lays it out, when someone sins against me, and acknowledges it and wants forgiveness. I forgive them. What if they do it multiple times? I forgive them. Well, I don't think they're genuine. Come over to Luke chapter 17. Similar issue, not the same context as we have in Matthew, but it's a similar point he's making. Uh, we'll pick up with verses 3 and 4 for time. Be on your guard. Here's something we must be alert to because here's a serious responsibility for us. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Same kind of thing we were told. And uh, we looked at 1 Timothy 5, what we're told in uh, Matthew 18. Not the same word, but the same point. Rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and return to you seven times saying, I repent, you will forgive him. Now, let's put here in a firm way, and a number of commentators note that the end of the verse, you will uh, forgive him, or as you have in the margin, you will forgive him. That's not a command. You must forgive him. That's a statement of something you will do. You know, sort of like with your, one of your kids. You say, you must clean your room. That might leave it over. Maybe they won't, but they'll have broken what you require. Jesus doesn't say that. It's sort of like you would say to them, you will clean your room. What you're really saying, no matter what it takes, what has to be done, you're going to do it. This is what God, Jesus says. If he comes to you seven times a day and says, I repent, you will forgive him. Uh, 
The disciples understand, <laughs> Lord, increase our faith. I mean, seven times a day, I sat down to figure this out. If you take out time for eating and sleeping, this means every two hours he's sinning against you. Maybe he even sins against you when you sleep. Maybe every three hours then. You know what you begin to say? You begin to take upon yourself responsibility. I was reading what someone wrote uh, and talking about repentance, forgiveness. Of course, the doctrine of forgiveness is all important, but it is predicated on an accurate doctrine of true repentance. Now, the danger of this is we set ourselves up to what? Not concentrate on my responsibility. You will forgive him. I set myself up as a judge. I don't think his repentance is genuine. So I've made that subjective judgment that God hasn't entrusted to me. And I take that as an excuse for not doing what he tells me I have to do. I went through to check one of my studies. Uh, the word repent or repentance, the noun and the verb form for repent or repentance, is used 56 times in the New Testament. I could not find one place where it says my responsibility is to be sure someone else's repentance is genuine. Now, when I take upon it's true, before God, he's looking at the heart. But I need to be careful that I fulfill the responsibility he's placed on me. I don't try to take God's responsibility on myself. Jesus said, if he comes to you seven times a day saying, I repent, you will forgive him. My reaction was, Lord, after about the third time, I have serious concerns about the genuineness of his repentance. And if the repentance is not genuine, then you can't expect me to be forgiving. Now, you see what's happened? I have created an excuse to justify for myself not doing what God says my responsibility is. I look at it like this. When sin happens, there are three parties involved, ultimately. There's the person who sins. Their responsibility is to stop the sin, repent. Turn from it, make it right. There's the person who sinned against. Or... I was aware of the sin, perhaps. Uh, either way, you have to rebuke the person, confront them for their sin, and if they repent, you forgive them. And then there's everybody else whose responsibility to be involved in restoration in one way or another. I wasn't the person who sinned. I wasn't the person who sinned against. I'm just an observer. How can I help? What can I do? Now, when we lose perspective, you know what happens we become those who justify themselves for not doing what God says you do. How am I going to stand before the Lord in light of Matthew 18, in light of Luke 17, in light of Galatians 6, 1, and say, well, why didn't you forgive them? Well, Lord, 490 times. I mean, anybody with common sense knows their repentance wasn't genuine. Seven times in one day, Lord, I have common sense. I knew it wasn't genuine. How am I going to answer when the Lord says, I didn't tell you to evaluate whether it was genuine. I didn't tell you. If it's genuine, you will forgive them. I told you, you will forgive them. Well, now why didn't you do what I told you? Well, I thought if they did it seven times a day, it wasn't genuine. I didn't tell you to think about it. <laughs> I didn't tell you to evaluate it. It's because we're in Galatians 6.1. We have to restore this person. There is no excuse for me not doing what I should do. Now, if I'm the one who sins, I should be rebuked or corrected. And if I say, I have to say there are times when people uh, say, you know, yeah, I repent. It's sin. I'm going to stop it. I want to get right with the Lord. 
And sometimes I think, I, you know, I really wonder if they're genuine. There are people, occasions where the board has dealt with people and it comes into the process. There are occasions where a person, on more than one occasion, the week I was going to announce to the congregation their sin, they came in. Oh, it's sin. I repent. I don't, I, I want to get right with the Lord. All right, we won't. You wonder, did they do it just to avoid it? And a person later ends up back, came to the same point. What? I can't tell. Sometimes those I thought who weren't genuine ended up being by the pattern of their life afterwards to demonstrate they were genuine. Sometimes it seemed that those who seemed the most genuine were just looking for a way out. You know, yeah, I repent. I, I'm going to deal with it. And all they were looking forward to was so they didn't get disciplined. A month later, we get a letter in the mail. We have left the church. Please take our name off the roll. Well, that's so you can't discipline me. I can't control those things. I can only do what the Lord tells me to do. So I say this because I get concerned every, you know, so many times we seems like we just lose our way. And I have to stop and think, Lord, in this, what is my responsibility? If I'm the one who sinned, I'm responsible to make it right. I take the rebuke. I want to correct it. But this idea, of course, there's repentance, but that's the, uh, there is forgiveness, but it's dependent on true repentance. Well, that's true when God looks at a heart, but that doesn't change my responsibility. God didn't tell Peter when he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Seven times? Well, Peter, first you have to be sure the repentance is genuine. Who am I to insert this into God's word? He simply says, I don't, you don't forgive him seven times. You do it 70 times seven. And furthermore, if you don't, God won't forgive you. You're on your way to hell. Oh, I don't know. But my responsibility is clear. Seven times a day, he says, I repent. You will forgive him. Is there any reason for me to be confused? I sometimes wonder, do we as God's children listen? There were times when I was young, my dad was a supervisor at U.S. Steel. He didn't know how delicate I was growing up. And there were times he would tell me, what did I tell you to do? Well, you told me to do this, but dad, this is what, what did I tell you to do? Well, you told me. Did you do it? No. That's all that matters. I think standing before the Lord, you know, what did I tell you to do? Well, yes, uh, you said if he repents, forgive him. But Lord, he did it five times in one day. What would you expect me to do? I expect you to do what I told you to do. You will forgive him. Then we're involved there with the restoration process. Now, if he lied, the Lord will deal with that. I'm not God. He doesn't ask me to intrude my subjective evaluation into this. Uh, come back to Ephesians 4. That's just after Galatians. So come back to Galatians 6 and turn over a few pages, and then we'll come back and wrap up the opening verses here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Another way of saying that, don't walk out of step with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Stay in line under His control. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Note the standard. Just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore be Im imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. Um, so come back uh, to Galatians 6. Galatians 6. 
We are to be restoring one another. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens. This is another command. Uh, present imperative. It's just not an isolated case. We see this can be kind of, you know, a regular thing. We're bearing one another's burdens. We are commanded to do it. We are to step in what it takes to help this believer. I don't know. Every time I help him get up, get right aligned, he falls back down. Well, you keep on bearing one another's burdens. Um, that's uh, our responsibility. Uh, just from 1 Corinthians 12. As members of the body of Christ, have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You know, we lose that perspective. And all of a sudden, we have a distance between someone in the body uh, because they have failed, they have stumbled. Oh, well, oh, that's affecting now my relationship. I don't know. Uh, bear, keep on bearing one another's burdens. Uh, this must be a regular part of our lives as God's people. This is, you can't claim to be walking in step with the Spirit under His control and not doing what He says. That would grieve the Spirit. But when we were sealed for the day of redemption, I'm not walking by the Spirit when I'm grieving Him and not doing what He would have me do. Um, and therefore, fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is not the Mosaic law. The law of Christ is what Christ would have us do as his people. We are not without an authority. He is the master. We are the slaves. I obey his commands. It's because it's called their law, but it's not the law of Christ. Uh, come back to 1 Corinthians 9 so you're not confused on this. They will say, oh, it says law. It must be the Mosaic law. No, it's the law of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. Paul says, to, verse 20, to the Jews I become as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law. No, I'm not under the law. But when with the Jews, I don't eat ham sandwiches. Fine. Uh, I'm not looking to offend the Jews. Uh, I want to win them to those, verse 21, who are without the law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So the only law Paul submissive to is the authority of Christ and his law, his commands. Uh, so we fulfill the law of Christ, his requirement for us as his slaves. You know, remarkable. We are his slaves, but we are his fellow heirs. We are the children of God. Uh, we are blessed. When we fulfill the law of Christ, we'll be walking by the Spirit. So we have to do this. If we're not handling this right, no matter how proud we are, danger is we swing from one side to another. Um, we say, oh, people are getting soft on sin. So we want to correct that. We're going to show how hard we are with sin. And we're not functioning any more biblical than they are. I mean, yeah, we don't tolerate it here. And those who get involved in sin, we deal with. Well, la di da We're just sinning in another way. We're not fulfilling the law of Christ by bearing one another's burdens. God's goal is restoration, not rejection. The rejection, when it becomes necessary, when they are cut off, is when they will not, under any pressure, give up their sin. If they won't, then we have no choice. But we're working it as hard as we can, with as much love as we can, with as much patience, with as much consideration because restoration is the goal because he's commanded us to bear one another's burdens to help this stumbling Christian uh, 
this Christian has fallen into sin and therefore thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Let's summarize this. I've put some summary points together that we'll put up on the screen. Number one, believers are members of God's family. We started out being calling them brethren. Remember, we are God's family. I mean, how easily people get offended and walk out. I mean, you know, we're family. Uh, we're God's family. He's brought us together in this point, uh, place. That ought to mean something. We don't give up on one another. Uh, secondly, believers do get caught in sin. Uh, I'm not saying that there's an excuse for it. But before we become too self-righteous, remember James says the sin of the tongue is a problem for all of us. And we just don't get that. We like to talk about those terrible sins. The, you know, we put uh, the big three up here or something like that. James says it's the tongue that is set on fire by hell and turns into a raging blaze. We've seen the picture of that when you get the fires going in parts of our country. How destructive they are. James says that's the tongue. Uh, so believers do get caught in sin. And we don't want to be accepting of any sin. We start with ourselves, uh, being careful with ourselves. Thirdly, believers must help restore those in sin. It's not an option. It's a command. If we want to obey Christ, the law of Christ, you must restore. You've got to be part of that process. Those who, are, who sin. Fourth, believers must be gentle in restoring the sinner. Uh, there is to be a meekness a humility in it. I don't come because I am uh, spiritually superior to you. I am weak in so many ways myself. It's only by God's grace that I haven't involved in something or other. I'm here to help them. I understand. That doesn't mean we're tolerant of sin. But our goal is not to beat them down. The goal is to restore them. We must be gentle in restoring the sinner. Number five, believers must be careful in restoring others. And that's the other side. Be gentle. Be careful about your attitude. Otherwise, you may slide into sin with that pride and arrogance and uh, wrong attitude. Uh, you don't want to get off track. Um, I mean, think how God is. You know, think, uh, go and read about Israel in the Old Testament. He keeps telling them, in spite of all their rebellion over so many years, he says, if you will just repent, turn back to me, I'll take care of you. I want to forgive you. That's how he deals with us. And we become so, you know... We must be careful in restoring others. Number six, we must bear one another's burdens. Their burdens are burdens. doesn't mean their sin is my sin. But I have the concern for them. There is something crushing them down. I want to help pick them up. You're not in this alone. God put us in a family. And what the family does when one member gets sick... The other members work to help. When my member's having trouble, uh, we, how can we help out? I mean, how many times do parents bear the, bail their kids out? Um, you know, it's, we must bear one another's burdens. That's all the things believers must do. And number seven, obedience to Christ requires this. It's not optional. So we're going to go through this. Remember, it ended. Obedience to Christ requires it. Uh, I can't be 
an obedient child of his walking by the Spirit if I don't do what he tells me. I'm not keeping in this step with the Spirit if I don't. So it's amazing how self-righteous we can become, how experts we can become and how terrible someone else's sin is and fail to do what we should do, which means we've sinned in another way. We're going to be careful that as a body we are manifesting and demonstrating all that God says we are to do and to be. And it's his grace that provides the enablement and the strength. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing, the blessing of forgiveness. Lord, not only the forgiveness we experienced when we placed our faith in Christ, but, Lord, that forgiveness and cleansing, the blood of Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Lord, it's a sad reality. We do stumble. We do trespass. And we all stumble in many ways, as you have told us. And the tongue is a great offender. Lord, we want to examine ourselves in light of the word and then be ready to help those who may be in difficulties, in stress, may be out of step with the Spirit, may be grieving the Spirit, may be in rebellion in an area of their life. Lord, we don't come to help them because we are spiritually superior. We come to help because we are fellow members of the family. We have a concern for one another. We are instruments of the Spirit to be used in bearing their burden, strengthening them, restoring them to fellowship. May that be the characteristic of our body as we continue to grow and serve together in Christ's name. Amen.